Great, so let's go ahead and get formally started. So hello and welcome to our Greater Gulf Coast event, Parkinson's 101, what you and your family should know. I'm Krista Ellis, Community Program Manager for the Florida and Gulf Coast chapters of the Parkinson's Foundation. I'm tuning in today from Tampa, Florida, and I warmly welcome you to our program today. We'd love to know where you're tuning in from, so feel free to share your location by typing it in the Q&A box. And I want you to know that you're not alone and your Parkinson's community is here with you today. Before I introduce our expert, I'd like to share a few things about the Parkinson's Foundation. The Parkinson's Foundation hosts virtual events each Monday. Wednesday and Friday of the week. Each Mindful Monday, we practice a different topic of mindful meditation with our Parkinson's community across the nation. Each Wellness Wednesday, we explore topics of most importance to you. And of course, what foundation would we be if we didn't tackle exercise? So join us each Fitness Friday for a class specific to Parkinson's disease, health, and exercise. To learn more and to register for our virtual experience, please visit parkinson.org backslash pdhealth. The Parkinson's Foundation Gulf Coast Chapter is grateful for the unwavering support of our chapter partners and sponsors. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Acadia, Medtronic, Kiowa Kieran, Amniel, Synovian, and Accorda. Together, we are able to bring education, resources, and support to people with Parkinson's and their families. Thank you. You can learn more about our chapter sponsors by visiting our virtual, virtual exhibit hall. Jennifer will place that link in the chat for you, and you can also see that link on the screen. That's parkinson.org backslash Gulf Coast chapter supporters. The Parkinson's Foundation provides families with three resources, including our website, parkinson.org, educational books, webinars, podcasts, a hospitalization kit, and our toll-free bilingual helpline, one 800 4 PD info, which is staffed by Parkinson's specialists. Please do not hesitate to reach out to our helpline staff for any Parkinson's support you may need. We are here for you. And of course, who would I be if I didn't toot my own horn? Don't forget to tune into next week's Mindfulness Monday with me and our mindful Parkinson's community. Start your week with calmness as you take part in guided relaxation techniques to help boost brain power and reduce stress. We get behind the research in mindful meditation and how it can impact Parkinson's disease. So this coming Monday, we will be practicing a loving kindness, mindful meditation. Sign up and join me this Monday at parkinson.org backslash pdhealth. And next Wellness Wednesday, we'll learn how the role of a social worker can play in helping people with Parkinson's and their families better understand and cope with the daily and ongoing challenges related to cognitive change. This talk will cover both practical and emotional strategies for coping. You can learn more and register at that link, parkinson.org backslash pdhealth. Thanks, Jen, for putting all those links in the chat for us. Appreciate that. And so today, we will explore what Parkinson's is, what causes it, some common symptoms of PD, treatment options, and strategies for managing symptoms, and of course, anything that you guys put in that Q&A tool, we will address. So today's event, again, is not intended to be a lecture, but rather a discussion between our expert and our web audience. So please ask our expert questions through the Q&A box. This really is a great, great opportunity to take advantage of Dr. Deeks' time. So thank you, Dr. Deeks. And now, it's my sincere pleasure to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Daniel Deese from the University of South Alabama. Dr. Deese, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Like I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. So my role is, uh, I'm, an, I'm a neurologist, but I'm an expert in movement disorders. And it's important to understand that there's a real difference there. And I think that's something that a lot of patients may not necessarily understand because you think that, well, if you're a neurologist, like you can't get more subspecialized than that. Uh, but what it means is that I did my residency in neurology, my training in neurology, and I could have went out into the community and practice. Uh, but then instead, I did additional training just in movement disorders and Parkinson's disease as a fellowship. Uh, and then I moved back to the University of South Alabama in Mobile and started the movement disorders program here uh, in 2012. And I've been here since then. 
but I, I think as a Parkinson's patient, uh, there's not. It, it's really uh, important to be able to go see a expert in movement neurology uh, if there's one close to you. There's not always somebody that's uh, right next door or anything like that. There's not enough of us, unfortunately. Um, but that's a little bit of my background. I've actually been in Mobile now for, um, geez, 22 years. Uh, it's not home for me, but uh, but it is now, right? Uh, so I really appreciate the opportunity. As we're talking about Parkinson's, uh, if you've got any questions, just throw them in the little uh, the Q and A, and we'll we'll go through them kind of one by one, and um, we're going to learn about Parkinson's if that's all right with you. So let's start out with uh, what is Parkinson's disease? That's always a good place to start, right? Uh, Parkinson's is a problem where uh, the brain doesn't make enough dopamine, and dopamine is the neurotransmitter of movement, uh, and with Parkinson's disease, you say average age of onset is age 60, uh, but 10% of all patients with Parkinson's will have onset before age 40, uh, and it, it, and then 10% of all patients with Parkinson's will have onset um, uh, from a genetic version. So in other words, a version that runs in families, that's about 10% of all patients with Parkinson's. Although the, the youngest I've ever diagnosed with Parkinson's was age 18. Uh, and so that was a really fast progression of Parkinson's disease, and that was a really rare genetic version of it. So there's so many different parts of Parkinson's. Let's talk about some of the movements that you get with Parkinson's. So everybody focuses on the tremor, right? And with tremor and Parkinson's disease, that's 75% of all patients with Parkinson's, although that automatically tells you that 25% of all patients with Parkinson's never get a tremor, and that really surprises too many people. Uh, and, you know, we say a tremor at rest, so imagine if my hand's on the table and I get something like this, but then if I move my hands up to action, like I'm grabbing onto the coffee or something, and then the tremor goes away, but if I wait about five seconds or so, that tremor is going to start coming back and looking something like that. And we would still call that a tremor at rest. So this becomes a problem doing things like, uh, like grabbing onto the coffee and uh, whatever, uh, screwdrivers, um, tools around the house, uh, doing chores, uh, eating utensils, all this type of stuff. <clears throat> so there's tremor and Parkinson's disease. And then the, the second major uh, movement in Parkinson's is you get these small, slow movements. So uh, an example of what I'm talking about would be, uh, I ought to be able to take my hand and go big and fast like this. Uh, that would be a normal type of movement. But in Parkinson's, it can be that the whole movement's too slow. Or it can be that I'm doing okay and it starts out really big, but then as I keep going, it gets smaller and smaller. Or in Parkinson's, it can be that I'm doing okay, I'm going big and fast, and then it gets stuck, and then it starts going again. And the fancy word for that is bradykinesia, but it's just a small, slow movement in Parkinson's disease. So we get tremor at rest, bradykinesia, these small, slow movements. And then muscle stiffness. So the muscles get really stiff and rigid. And your neurologist probably checks it in the wrist, but it's not just in the wrist. It's in everywhere you got, uh, in, uh, in your arms, in your legs, in your trunk, and you're everywhere. And with the trunk, that rigidity that comes with Parkinson's disease, a lot of times is a little bit more on the front than it is on the back. And so that's when people talk about getting stooped posture uh, with Parkinson's, where, you know, maybe they're kind of bent over like this as they're... Uh, is there standing there? Uh, that's just from the rigidity in Parkinson's. So uh, tremor at rest, uh, small, slow movements, uh, muscle stiffness, and rigidity. And then a little bit later on with Parkinson's, maybe seven, eight years down the road, you're just going to start getting into being off balance. Uh, and in the classic way that that gets described is uh, before I fell down, it was too late for me to do anything about it uh, before I even realized I was falling down. And in that statement is well over 200 years old since uh, James Parkinson wrote his paper in 1817 describing what Parkinson's disease was. And even then, it was it, 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 uh, people were still talking about that back in that, in that time. Mm -hmm. So those, those are the movement problems in Parkinson's disease. Um, and, you know, people say, well, well, what about the, that's the movement problems. What about the, the non-motor problems in Parkinson's disease? And so many things get involved there. So, for example, with the non-motor stuff in Parkinson's, the whole GI tract runs on dopamine. We said uh, dopamine was the neurotransmitter of movement. And there's not enough dopamine in the system to make it go work right. And so 90% of all patients with Parkinson's disease get uh, constipation. It's a huge amount, right? And 
And it's not just that the, the, the intestine slows down, but the stomach slows down too. So they get what we call is gastroparesis, which is uh, like if I go eat a sandwich, like I had a sandwich for lunch today, and uh, that should go live in my stomach. It was, it was barbecue. It was great. Like I was very excited about my barbecue sandwich. And now I'm drinking my coffee, so take that. But uh, so <laughs> if I go eat my barbecue sandwich, it's going to go live in my stomach for like an hour, and then it's going to move on down the line. Uh, but in Parkinson's disease, what can very commonly happen is that sandwich goes into the stomach and then it sits there for like three, four or five hours. And that becomes a real problem, especially when you're taking medicines for Parkinson's disease, like Cinemat or Carbidopa Levodopa, uh, because that's, that's one of the classic ones for Parkinson's, but it doesn't get absorbed in the stomach. It gets absorbed in the very beginning of the small intestine. And so if that Cinemat never makes it to the small intestine because it's sitting there with the sandwich, uh, for five hours, then you did everything right with your sentiment, but it didn't help you because you never, it didn't even have the opportunity to absorb it. So that's 90% of all patients with Parkinson's. Uh, you get into a lot of other problems with Parkinson's disease too. So things like um, REM sleep behavior disorder, which is uh, acting out dreams, screaming out loud, throwing punches at night, is whatever you're dreaming of, you're going to go do that. Uh, so like the one that I always think about is... Um, I had a patient that was a championship boxer in the Navy when he was a young guy. And when he was older, he had Parkinson's disease. And uh, his REM sleep behavior disorder would be that uh, anytime uh, when he's sleeping at night, uh, he's going to do boxing. So, like, he stands up on the mattress and he's, like, boxing in his sleep. You know, think of, like, a sleepwalking child. This is incredibly dangerous, right? Because he can, um, he knows how to throw a punch. His uh, wife is right there, so she's going to get punched. And then, you know, staying in on a mattress is really hard to do when you're 20 years old. If you're like 73 and you have Parkinson's, this is a bad idea. Like he's going to fall down and break arms and break legs and these sorts of things. You know, with REM sleep behavior disorder, the other thing that I, uh, you know, some other examples of that that I've had are a patient that um, he and his spouse were just wonderful. They were uh, like high school sweethearts and I loved each other very dearly. And, and for whatever reason, guys we like to we dream of like intruders into the house or people are trying to break in and get stuff or whatever uh and so in his dream is somebody was breaking into the house and so he he um grabbed the spouse by the by the night shirt like threw her against the wall she screamed when she screamed he woke up and realized oh wow like this is you know uh, he's hurting the one that he loves and this is a very common scenario of REM sleep behavior disorder and parkinson's disease um the uh, another example that I had was um, just the nicest uh, patient, and uh, she was older and retired and uh, widowed, and had a bunch of cats. And uh, and so in her dream, she's like getting up out of bed, walking over, like picking up the cat. I'm gonna pet the cat, and then like put the imaginary cat that I'm dreaming about on the cat stand or whatever those things are called. I don't know. And then like I'm gonna reach over here and grab another cat, and that's, that's what her dream was. You know, the, the reason that I, I make a big deal out of REM sleep behavior disorder like that, and I tell the stories, is because it's really easy to treat. So, like a tiny dose of clonazepam, like a 0.5 milligram pill of clonazepam, most of the time can manage that. Um, because people fall out of bed and break arms and legs. I've had patients break their hand on the on the on the bedside table and break the lamp and the cell phones and all this type of stuff. So, I just want patients to be aware of it. Um, other common uh, Parkinson's disease uh, non-motor problems are going to be things like orthopedic hypertension. Move on. Sure. Oh, I'm curious how how does one know that they're living with uh, REM sleep disorder if they live alone, say, or sleep alone? Okay. Um, and I know in the clinic um, back in my days when I was doing PD research, a lot of people didn't recognize that they had REM sleep behavior disorder. So could you maybe? Right. Elaborate a little bit more on how an individual living with Parkinson's might be able to identify that they are sleeping with REM, sleep behavior disorder, um, and how it could influence the healthy psych cycles of, of sleep. Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, it, it's easy enough if you've got a spouse there that is awake when you're doing these types of things and then they'll notice it. But if, if there's not a spouse there, maybe you live by yourself or one of these types of things, um, you know, you'll notice I've had patients that will say, well, you know, I wake up and the bed sheets are all over the place. I mean, like they're over crumpled in the corner and 
I, I don't know, like I'm, I'm upside down in the bed or something, you know, like I'm not hanging upside down. Like my, my head is at the foot of the bed and, you know, these types of things. Um, or I, I had one patient that, um, <laughs> he, he noticed that he had a problem with REM sleep behavior disorder because he, uh, woke up in the middle of the night with his RBD, uh, went to the refrigerator, got a snack and then went back to the bed and he woke up and had like some crumbs, uh, like some residue from his snack, uh, like on the bed sheets. Uh, you know, so things like that can be helpful too. Um, you know, it, it, but you're absolutely right in saying that if the patient's asleep, a lot of times they don't realize they're doing this type of stuff, right? In the same way that a child doesn't realize that they're sleepwalking, like a five-year-old child or something like that. It's a great question. Thank you. So we did have a live question come in from Carol. Carol is interested in knowing if tissues in arms and legs become hard and sore and achy. Is this related to Parkinson's disease? And she writes, it feels bumpy and ropey. Can you touch on, on, on the changes in tissue and muscles? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. So, you know, with Parkinson's, the muscles are going to get everything stiff and rigid. And so because of that rigidity, the muscles will get sore. Um, although there's a couple of different things going on here. So one, the muscles could get stiff and sore from that. But then also you have things like arthritis, you know, so if you have like joint pain in my knee or in my elbow or something like that, like arthritis doesn't have anything to do with Parkinson's disease, but it is really common, right? So if, if you're having limb pain, it would be worthwhile to go get checked out by the primary care doctor to make sure that we're not missing um, something more mechanical, you know what I mean? Like I have, I have a rotator cup tear or something in my shoulder because you don't want to miss those sorts of things too. It's a great question. Great, thank you. Now we can continue with um, non-motor symptoms. Sure. So uh, other common uh, non-motor problems with Parkinson's disease, you get um, orthostatic hypotension, um, which is your blood pressure is going to vary all over the place. And, and this is a real problem. So uh, if you think in terms of a regular blood pressure is going to be something like 120 over 80, that's where we want to be, right? And then what is normal in Parkinson's disease is you're going to go up and down throughout the day. So you go like as low as like 90 over 60 or 80 over 50 or something way too low. And then you go up to like 190 over whatever, like way too high. And then back down to 90 over 60, way too low. And you're just going to go up and down all day long. And, and typically it takes about an hour and a half to go through one cycle of going up and down. And, you know, one of the, one of the other main problems here is that when, when your blood pressure is that low, there's not enough blood going to the head to keep it working right. And so you're going to be in a little bit of confused state of mind. So if you picture, like, if you've ever been, I don't know, Christy, maybe you've done this, like uh, you're out working, like in the, in the hot sun or something in the, in the garden or whatever, you're doing yard work and then you're squatting down and you're working and then you stand up really fast and you get lightheaded, dizzy, feel like you're going to pass out, you got to grab onto something. It's a, but it's exactly like that feeling, except it doesn't go away after like 30 seconds. Like you'll, you'll have that um, sustained. Um, and, you know, so often patients and even primary care doctors, we get locked into this idea of thinking of high blood pressure. You know, I've been taking my high blood pressure pills for 40 years, and I'm not thinking in terms of low blood pressures. And, you know, if, you, if you're going up and down like this, and then you add in some high blood pressure medicines, you're just going to shift that whole thing down. So now to like 90 over 60, and then going up to 190 over whatever, and then back down to 90 over 60, I take my blood pressure pills. And now I'm going to do like, I don't know, um, 80 over 50, like way too low. You're not going to be able to function at 80 over 50. And then uh, up to like 160 over whatever, and then back down to 80 over 50. And so you get you know, like a lot of times, these are when the patients, they, you know, like they're in the recliner maybe, and they're just kind of zoned out. They don't really respond to maybe the spouse is trying to get their attention or, hey, what's going on, you know, and they're just kind of falling asleep all the time. A lot of times it's because the blood pressure is too low. Uh, and you know, one of the most critical things with low blood pressure like that is making sure that you're staying hydrated and uh, drinking plenty of water. If there's not enough water in the system, um, none of it's going to run right. You know what I mean? So, um, and, and you can tell that you're hydrated if the urine's clear. If the urine's yellow, you got to drink more water, right? Um, and then one of the other problems that Parkinson's patients get into is Parkinson's is going to affect all these types of things that we don't have to think about is you get, a, you get a delayed signal from the bladder to the brain that says, hey, I got to go to the bathroom. And 
so, I mean, I don't know what is normal depending on like how much coffee and the hydration you have. Uh, but you get that first signal from the bladder that says, Hey, I kind of got to go, you know, maybe you got, I don't know, two, three hours or something like that. And then, you know, Hey, this is happening, right? Like I, I got to go now. Um, and in Parkinson's disease, from that very first uh, little signal that says, hey, I got to go to the bathroom, it's I got to go right now within like two or three minutes. So this happens really quickly. And then you put that in combination with things like uh, my, my movements are all uh, slow and small and I'm, I'm a little bit off balance. And man, I got to get I got to get to the bathroom right now. And so people will you'll find patients will purposefully dehydrate themselves. They're not drinking enough water because I don't want to go to the bathroom in my pants. And so I'm, now I'm not drinking enough water and the blood pressure is dropping. I'm getting lightheaded, dizzy, feel as if I'm going to pass out. And that's a major problem. Um, you know, so make sure we're staying hydrated. And then, you know, one thing, drinking caffeine all day long, caffeine is going to dehydrate you too, right? Caffeine just makes you go to the bathroom. So, you know, it's okay if you have your coffees and stuff, but make sure you're drinking your waters too. It's a good point. Uh, other, other problems with um, non-motor symptoms in Parkinson's, uh, depression is incredibly common. So, you know, we say that Parkinson's disease is a problem of the brain doesn't make enough dopamine, and it's true, but it's also the brain doesn't make enough serotonin. And serotonin is the, uh, the neurotransmitter of, of mood and depression. And so about a third of all patients with Parkinson's disease are going to get depression. And, you know, I kind of think of it in, in two different ways. Like one, you, know, you get depression because of a very mechanical reason, like, right, there, there's not enough serotonin in the brain to make it work right. And so then I go get depression. But in, in the same way that, like, if there's not enough motor oil on the car engine, it's not going to run right. right. If there's not enough serotonin in the engine, it's not going to run right. But then the second part about depression is, hey, I got Parkinson's and I can't go do the stuff that I want to go do. And especially for those patients that tend to be um, a little more independent or a little more uh, you know, maybe they were engineers or something, you know, us guys, we, like we, for some silly reason, us guys, we put our sense of self-worth and our ability to go do the task. And, you know, now I can't go do the task and get out and I don't know, mow the yard or whatever. And uh, because of Parkinson's, and then that's really devastating. And I get a lot of depression from that. And, you know, one thing that I want patients to know is that it, it's okay to talk about this type of stuff. Talk about it with your spouse, talk about it with your friends and family. Talk about it with your primary care doctor and, and your uh, neurologist because there's a lot of medicines that could be helpful uh, in Parkinson's disease and helpful in depression and these sorts of things too. Um, and, and then, you know, I, I, used to, um, I used to work in Augusta, Georgia with the, um, with the masters there and everybody played golf. And, you know, I'd have to remind my patients, it's okay if you're playing golf and you don't have the same handicap that you did when you were 22 years old, you know, like just get out and go have a fun day, right? Like it's beautiful outside, go play, you know, like that type of thing, right? It's okay. So 30% of all patients with Parkinson's get depression. Um, one of the other strange, it sounds strange when you say it, but Parkinson's patients will get too much sweating uh, and particularly like, um, like even when it's not warm, like it's in the middle of the winter or they got the air conditioner on, like right on them or something, and they're just sweating so much and like the sheets are drenched in the middle of the night and not this type of thing. That's really common from Parkinson's too. And then uh, other other problems with all these things you don't have to think about. So in Parkinson's disease, commonly you can get things like uh, erectile dysfunction or uh, difficulties with orgasm and things like that. And, and that's a very real component of life, too. And that can happen from Parkinson's in the same way that it's affecting all these other systems that, that aren't working right also. Um, Got a couple of questions for you, Dr. Deese. Sure, let's hit them. So the relationship between Parkinson's disease, you talked briefly about depression, but also this other umbrella of mental health um, and anxiety in Parkinson's disease. And we had um, a guest write in, is paranoia caused by Parkinson's or is it from the treatment? So could you just talk about the relationship between anxiety, depression, and potential paranoia if, they, if these types of symptoms are caused? our relationship to the disease or relationship to the drugs? So with anxiety and depression, I mean, those, those really kind of go hand in hand. I mean, they're two different things, but so commonly they get wrapped in together. And I really encourage my patients, I'm a big believer in subspecialty in medicine, right? So like, if you have, if you have a heart attack, you're going to go to the cardiologist. Like nobody's going to think twice about that. 
You know, if you have kidney problems, you go to the kidney doctor. If you have a stress, anxiety, depression, you go to the stress, anxiety, and depression doctor, and that's the psychiatrist. And the psychologist can help too. So the psychiatrist is an MD. The psychologist is a PhD. And a lot of times they work together in combination with the movement disorder neurologist to go deal with these things. And that's really the ones that you get the best um, effect on, the best way to go manage it. But you know, it's an, it's an important part of the conversation not to leave out this thing of uh, stress, anxiety, depression. And then it, it, it brings up another important too, like uh, that we were talking about tremor earlier. And 75% of all patients with Parkinson's disease get a tremor. But any type of tremor that I get is going to be, there's some things that are going to make that worse. So anytime that I'm stressed out, lack of sleep, um, if I'm anxious, uh, if I'm really excited, I just won the lottery, uh, like I'm late for work, oh crap, here we go. Like all those types of things, my tremor is going to be worse. You get frustrated, angry, and that type of stuff. So if you're asking yourself, I wonder why my tremor is really bad today, and those sorts of things are happening, then that would be why the tremor is worse. It, it, it makes for an important point. Um, you know, so so things like depression and anxiety, I can say that, well, yeah, I mean, they're more likely in Parkinson's disease, and 30% of them get it. Although uh, stress, anxiety, and depression is so common just amongst everybody. I mean, everybody gets a little bit stressed out, right? And, and you know, some folks, it's just kind of how their brain was wired up, that they're a little bit more likely to get things like stress, anxiety, depression, and have been all of their life. And that's okay, but there's a lot of different things that can that we can do to go help with that. That's a great question. And so, would could we use the terms anxiety and paranoia interchangeably? Hmm. I don't think so. Uh, you know, paranoia is a little bit something different, right? And and by talking about paranoia, then we start getting into things like confusion and hallucinations and paranoia and what we call Parkinson's psychosis, maybe. Um, and, and that's an absolutely uh, worthwhile thing to go talk about too, right? Like this is really common. Uh, and not every Parkinson's patient is going to get things like confusion and hallucination. But you're really asking yourself where are things like confusion and hallucination coming from in Parkinson's disease? So, um, like for example, as we get older, uh, really starting about age 60 or 65, somewhere around there, normal physiology for us would be any sort of infection or fever I'm going to get some confusion and even hallucinations with. And, and, and like, that's such an important concept. I wish they would put it. I live in Mobile, Alabama, right? I wish they'd put on the billboards on I-10, you know, like uh, they, they can throw them on the billboards down in Florida too. That'd be great. Like, like this is such a common thing. So a classic example is when you're 20 years old and you get a, you get a bladder infection, it's uncomfortable, but it's not that big of a deal. Um, when you're 70 and you get a bladder infection, you get confusion and hallucinations from the bladder infection. Uh, and it's, it's any sort of inflammation like that. So other common reasons would be like I just had surgery. I don't know, like I had a knee replacement or back surgery or something like this. And, you know, for a good like two, three weeks, maybe even a month after that, you expect to have some worsening of confusion and hallucination just from the fact of doing surgery. Um, and, and, and that's an aging thing. And the other thing, so that, that's one of the, the big etiologies, one of the big reasons to go have confusion uh, in hallucinations of Parkinson's. And then one of the other big reasons to go have confusion and hallucinations of Parkinson's disease can be some of the medicines that we take, people can tolerate them when they're younger. So these are going to be medicines like Artane or Trihexaphenidil, which is really the best medicine in Parkinson's disease just for the tremor. But starting about age 60, 65, based off the way that medicine works, is it can commonly cause confusion and hallucinations. Other ones that can commonly cause confusion and hallucinations would be amantadine. Um, again, younger patients uh, tolerate amantadine really well. And amantadine's niche role in treatment of Parkinson's disease is for levodopa-induced dyskinesias. And we'll come back and talk about what those are in a little bit. But levodopa-induced dyskinesias are like uh, Michael J. Fox on TV and he's, everything's kind of moving around and I can't control it, like that type of thing. Um, but as patients get older, starting about age 60, 65, they start having problems with taking things like amantadine, too. Another example would be um, Benadryl. Like, we don't think twice about taking Benadryl. I've taken that all my life. But Benadryl works in a way that you start getting into confusion and hallucinations at about that age range, too. So I just want my patients to be aware of it. And one of the most common ones that gets thrown around in this patient population is oxybutynin. So we said earlier that uh, Parkinson's patients, they get a delayed signal from the bladder to the brain that says, hey, I got to go to the bathroom. And then, and then uh, oxybutynin commonly gets used for bladder incontinence. 
Uh, and the way that it works will cause confusion and hallucinations and Parkinson's disease. And, and so that's a really common one to be aware of. You stop the medicine and then it goes away. Uh, and the reason I want patients to be aware of oxybutynin is because there's options out there that work in a way that doesn't cause that type of problem in even in 83 year olds or something in, in older patients. So that would be a medicine called Berbetric uh, would be an option to go talk to your primary care doctor, your urologist about. That's a great question. Uh, so before we jump into treatment options, I, I just want to, somebody did post a question um, in the registration and they, they want to know, are hallucinations and restlessness normal for Parkinson's disease? So coming back to some of the symptoms, the common symptoms of Parkinson's. Yeah. So the question was, uh, are hallucinations uh, normal and a part of Parkinson's disease? Yeah. And they are also asking about restlessness in Parkinson's. Restlessness. Well, I wonder, I'm not sure what we mean by restlessness, but um, so I, I can take some guesses there. So uh, with with confusion, hallucinations, with psychosis, not every Parkinson's patient is going to get that. And then, you know, once you say that, okay, well, this isn't from any sort of underlying infection or fever or surgery or something like that that's happened recently, and then we're not taking any of the medicines that would commonly cause things like confusion and hallucinations. So things like artane or mantadine or oxybutynin, and, and these are gonna be older patients, you know, over the, um, you know, the 70, 80 year old, something like this. And then you can say, okay, well, this confusion and hallucinations is just from Parkinson's disease. And that can happen too. Uh, luckily, it's not so common. You know, and then of all the different medicines for Parkinson's disease, the one that's least likely to cause confusion or hallucinations is Cinemet, which is carbidopa levodopa. Which is, um, which is kind of nice and that Cinemet is really one of our, our mainstays of treatment. Uh, if I say that Parkinson's disease is a problem where the brain doesn't make enough dopamine, and then Cinemet, which is carbidopa levodopa, it just gets converted directly into dopamine. So it's a very straightforward way of going and dealing with the problem. That's an excellent question, Krista. I appreciate it. So just to frame um, the remainder of our time together here today, we've touched on what Parkinson's disease is, um, and some of the common symptoms, including motor and non-motor symptoms. I'd like us to spend a few minutes on treatment options, including medicinal lifestyle, exercise, surgery, maybe perhaps just lightly, since this is a foundational um, knowledge for people of, with, newly diagnosed with Parkinson's. And then I'd like to end on, you know, what research looks like for Parkinson's disease. Sure. I want to get a question about, um, you know, finding a cure. And I'd like to end um, kind of our topic, our, our coffee chat, if you will, today on the research of Parkinson's disease. So uh, let's dive into treatment options since we're kind of headed into sure. that. Yeah, that'd be perfect. So, uh, so we talked about Cinemat, which is carbidopa levodopa. Uh, and one thing that's really important about Cinemat uh, that a lot of times surprises patients is um, protein gets in the way of absorbing Cinemat. And protein is like meat and eggs. So chicken, beef, pork, fish, eggs, all those sorts of things, they're going to get in the way of absorbing the levodopa or the Cinemat. And so I tell my patients no protein up to an hour before or an hour after you take Cinemat. So, you know, like I'm not taking away your cheeseburgers and your steaks and your chicken wings and all this. Hey, man, I, I'm a guy. I love those things, too. Right. You can still have them, um, but just no protein one hour before or one hour after cinnamon or carbidopa levodopa. Let's let's kind of go through the different medicines that commonly get used. Um, so we talked a little bit about artane or trihexaphenidyl earlier. So that's going to be one that's particularly good for the tremor and Parkinson's disease, although it'll help with the small cell movements and the muscle stiffness, too. Um, and, uh, particularly, um, you know, if you're a younger type patient in your forties or fifties and then starting about age 60, 65, you start getting into problems with confusion and hallucination there, although it can cause some dry mouth too. Um, amantadine we talked about also amantadine is neutrals for leave it open induced dyskinesias, although it can be helpful with the, um, the small slow movements and the muscle stiffness also. So let's go to find what leave it open induced dyskinesias are. So when you're taking cinnamon, or carbidopa levodopa, um, those patients that take higher dosages of levodopa over longer periods of time are more likely to get levodopa-induced dyskinesias. And not everybody's going to get levodopa-induced dyskinesias, and I can't predict who's going to get them or who's not going to get them. Uh, but dyskinesias are going to be 
these uh, these kind of flowing movements that I can't control. You know, entry level dyskinesias, it might just be just a little something, you know, maybe in my foot and I don't even notice it. And, you know, my spouse notices it or something. Um, but then uh, more advanced dyskinesias can be really, that can be really a problem. Um, so mantadine can be helpful with dyskinesias. You know, uh, another class of medicines would be the dopamine agonist. And Dr. the way that this works, Dr. yeah. Since we're on amantadine, we did get a live question from Deb. She's asking, amantadine is an antiviral, and we're going to jump into a new, slightly different topic. Can it be used for COVID-19 for the PD patient? So maybe we address the COVID, no. <laughs> briefly come back to it, and then go back to treatment options. Yeah, yeah, it's a great, you know, I didn't think I was going to talk about COVID, but uh, that's cool. Let's talk about COVID. <laughs> so no, amantadine is not going to be helpful with COVID. Um, amantadine doesn't even get used for, for viral illnesses anymore. Um, this was helpful for the flu in the, in the 1960s. And then kind of by accident, we found out that it was helpful in Parkinson's disease in the early 1970s. But it's not useful for the flu anymore. So don't try to take that for COVID or for flu or anything. But it is really helpful in Parkinson's disease, particularly for leave it open induced dyskinesias. That's a great question. I just didn't anticipate it. Um, uh, so let's see. Where, oh, the dopamine agonists. So um, with dopamine agonists, these are going to be medicines like Mirapex or Pramipexol uh, or uh, Requip or Ropinirol or Nupro patch. It's a, it's a patch for Parkinson's disease. Um, and the way these medicines work is they work by getting more benefit out of the dopamine that's already there. So they can be really helpful. But you also get into some, some very real problems with these medicines that I want my patients to know about. So 15% of everybody taking... Uh, dopamine agonists. So medicines like Mirapex, Pramipexol, Requip, uh, Rope and Roll, um, Nupro, 15% of everybody is going to get problems controlling impulses uh, with, with that medicine. And the common ones, the ones in the study, are too much gambling, too much sex, too much shopping, too much eating. Although they can be whatever you're into. Like I've had patients that were buying too much. My favorite one is he was reading too much poetry. Uh, like I love poetry too. Like I really like Longfellow, but you don't get to sit there and read Longfellow for 12 hours a day and not stop to go to the bathroom and eat, you know, like that, that becomes a problem. Um, so if, if that's, if that's you, then talk to your neurologist about it. There's a lot of other options that we can go do besides the dopamine agonist. They can also make people really sleepy. Uh, and when I say sleepy, I mean like, uh, like I've had a patient that uh, couldn't finish the bowl of Cheerios that I was eating. Uh, before I like fell asleep and then like spilled the bowl of Cheerios, like that's some impressive sleepiness, right? Um, so the agonist can cause that type of problem too. And in the same way, like amantadine or artane, starting about age 60 or 65, uh, the dopamine agonist can also cause some confusion and hallucinations is a problem with the agonist. And, you know, with those types of things, just like artane and amantadine, if you, if you decrease or stop the medicine, it'll go away. Uh, but that's one that I want patients to be aware of. Um, other options, uh, other medicines to go treat Parkinson's disease, you have the um, medicines like Resagiline, uh, or Azelect is the name brand on that one, or Selegiline, or uh, Sifinamide Zodago is another one. Uh, and those medicines help prevent the breakdown of dopamine so they stay around longer. Um, it's, especially Sifinamide Zodago and, um, and uh, Resagiline and Azelect, people tolerate those, those medicines really well. They're once a day dosing. Uh, so they don't get into a lot of problems with it. So uh, kind of interestingly, um, it, as it gets metabolized, it gets metabolized into amphetamine derivatives. And so it can cause some confusion and hallucinations because of that. Although it can be helpful if people are really getting sleepy during the daytime too. Uh, and then one of the other big classes of uh, medicines for Parkinson's is going to be enticapone. Uh, or the other word for that is Comtan. Uh, and uh, the way that one works is it also helps prevent the breakdown of dopamine. So uh, so the dopamine can hang around longer there. And a lot of times, enticapone will get used in combination with Cinemet. So regular Cinemet is carbidopa, levodopa. Uh, the levodopa gets turned into dopamine. The carbidopa is what helps get the levodopa into the brain where we want it to be. Uh, and in, So that's Cinemet, which just means without emesis, without throwing up. Uh, and then there's Stilevo which is another combination pill. And that's got carbidopa, leave it open in it, plus enticapone, all three of those medicines in one combination pill. Uh, and so that's another common one that's out there that um, the patients may be taking. Um, I had a couple questions for you about um, drug yep, treatment. Yep, let's do it. 
So someone writes to us, is Raitari the number one prescribed medicine because of the time release? Uh, I, I don't think it's the number one prescribed medicine. Uh, I mean, I don't have any of those numbers in front of me or anything like that, but I, so what, let's, but let's talk about Raitaria. So Raitaria is a, another version of Carbidopa levodopa. It's packaged in a way that it might last a little bit longer, although there can be some variability there too. And, and it brings up another, um, uh, another point with things like Cinemet controlled release uh, or Cinemet CR. Uh, some patients to be taken out, and it, and it sounds really good, like controlled release. Oh, yeah, extended release Cinemet. That's what I want. Um, but one of the problems you get into with Cinemet uh, CR is you get a lot of variability of, of absorption of that medicine. So if that's what you're taking, then okay. But just understand that the, the way that that gets absorbed from the gut can have a lot of variation from one dose to the next dose. So uh, if, if, you're, uh, if you're having problems with that, it'd be something to bring up to your neurologist or your movement disorder expert or whomever you're seeing. That's a great question, Krista. I think you said you had other questions. What else you got? I have another one, yes. Do you recommend sublingual apomorphine as a treatment for unpredicted off periods? Hmm. That's a great question. Let's talk about it. So um, you've got a couple of different options there. And what we're talking about is... Um, Unpredictable off. So I'm taking my Cinemet, and let's say maybe I'm supposed to take my Cinemet four times a day. And then uh, I'm taking my Cinemet and I, you know, I get wearing off, which just means like, if you think if wearing off would be, um, imagine when you very first wake up in the morning and you haven't taken any medicines for Parkinson's disease all night long, and then you wake up and you're stiff and you're rigid and you got tremor, that would be in an off state. And so sometimes you can get wearing off during the daytime too. Like maybe your Cinemet doesn't quite last long enough and this type of stuff. And so you can have what we call as rescue medicines. And uh, sublingual apomorphine uh, would be an example of one of those. Um, there's some other examples too. So there's, uh, there's the sublingual apomorphine, which just came out, which is called Kenobi. Um, there's another one that's uh, injectable apomorphine, um, the diapican. And then a third one is uh, inhaled levodopa. Uh, people may have heard of inhaled levodopa too that's been on the market now for a little while. Uh, and these are medicines you just take if you need them. Uh, and so, like you think of things like with apomorphine, uh, I, I I do the wafer, I do the injection, and then and then really in about five minutes that starts working. So it happens really fast. And but with with the apomorphine, um, it doesn't la it lasts for about an hour or so, and then it wears off. So what you're trying to do is fill in that one hour gap that I got before I have to go take my Cinemet the next time. You know, if if you're taking things like the Apican or inhaled levodopa, like more than five times a day. And we're probably not doing this right. You know, we probably need to make an adjustment with a baseline level of Cinemat or whatever your medicines are, or Requip, I don't know, uh, a baseline level adjustment with that and, and versus taking these, these, um, these as-needed medications so many times during the day. It's a wonderful question. Oh, and then just to follow up, apomorphine, I know, it, this is not a pain medicine. I don't know why they called it that, but that's the generic name for it. It came out in the 70s. Uh, it has nothing to do with pain medicine, even though it's called apomorphine. Uh, Krista, you had another question for me. I, I have two more questions, but before we get into Perfect. the questions, I want us to kind of address this unique titration schedule for each person living with Parkinson's disease. So I know um, in the clinic, it can be very overwhelming when you're given this schedule of medication. So could you just touch on the importance of following a titration schedule, um, stay, staying on top of your meds on time, every time, and the importance yeah. of reducing symptoms based on your medication, your unique medication schedule. Yeah, that's very, that's the right way to put it. Like each Parkinson's patient is going to have their own unique schedule um, just because there can be so much variability from one patient to the next. And it's really hard to go take a pill five times a day. You know, I mean, um, people typically get the first one in the day and they get the last one in the day, but then what happens, you know, I'm supposed to take the one at 1 PM and now it's 3 PM. And what do I do? Just go ahead and take your, your medicines. Go ahead and take your cinnamon. It's okay if you forgot. And then you got to work, like with medicines like cinnamon, you got to work them around protein. And, and I get it, this can be difficult, but there's a lot of different ways you can go deal with that. So one of the common ones that you'll have patients do is, you know, maybe I've got like my pill box and I've got like the morning, the noon, and then the nighttime thing. And I can, I can look in the pill box. Like there's a pill still in there. That means I didn't take it, right? So that can be helpful. I've had a lot of patients that will, um, they'll set alarms on their cell phone. Uh, so that their alarm goes off and, okay, now I know I need to go take my phone. You know, uh, and another common one is 
well, you know, if I'm out doing stuff and I don't have the pills on me, so, you know, take some, take some cinnamon and put it in the car, you know, have some in your purse just for, you know, oops, I forgot, but okay, here we go. It's in the purse and I can go take it if I'm out um, having a day or something. So there's a lot of different ways to go do that. Um, it's a fantastic question. Okay, thank you, Dr. Deese, for answering that. So we have another question. Um, she writes, my mother, 81, is currently on Rosagiline and has no tremors, but stiffness. Would you recommend a dopamine agonist for her? Um, as patients get older, they tend to have more problems with dopamine agonists. So these are going to be medicines like Mirapex and Requip and Premipexol and Nupropatch and these types of things. Uh, and particularly at 81, I'd be a little bit more worried about things like confusion and hallucinations and making her too sleepy uh, for those types of medicines. But there's a lot of other options out there. So medicines like Cinemet could be really helpful, Levodopa. Uh, there's some other things, too, that she would be able to tolerate just fine. That's, that's a fantastic question. Thank you. And a question from Michelle. Whatever happened to Parcopa? Is it still available? Parcopa. Uh, it is still available. Uh, it doesn't get used very much. I don't think I've written a prescription for that in a long time, um, but it, it's still out there. Uh, other questions for me? Yes, yeah, so we have a few um, outstanding questions. The first question they write, if a cure is found, will it be able to fix the damage already done or just have it not get worse? That's a fantastic question. You're about to see how poorly my drawing skills are. Okay, you ready for this? I'm ready. I think you're gonna be able to read it. So, there we go. So he said Parkinson's is a problem where the brain doesn't make enough dopamine, right? And uh, like the, the bad news is our bodies aren't meant to last forever, uh, unfortunately. And we get a lot of redundancy in our bodies, but um, for example, your kidneys, you have way more function of, of your kidneys when you're born than you actually need, but you're going to lose some over time. In the same way, you're going to lose your ability to produce dopamine over time. So if there's like engineers out there, or people that like graphs, there you go. So this is dopamine. This is time. As I'm going through life, my brain is making less and less dopamine. And when I get to the point of, uh, we're just kind of making up the numbers a little bit, but when I get to the point of 15% of my ability to produce dopamine, 15% of my ability to produce dopamine, then that's where I'm gonna start having Parkinson's disease. So the small slow movements, muscle stiffness, rigidity, all those types of things. Although looking at this, I, I think this is a mirror image of what's happening on the camera. So sorry, I hope you can read backwards. Uh, and so what we're really trying to do, so this is like the golden eggs of Parkinson's research over the past um, 40 years, uh, is I want an ability to do some sort of a blood test or something. I don't know, like a MRI scan, something. When you're early on the graph, we'll say when you're age 20, that tells me that when you get to age 60, you're gonna have Parkinson's disease. So some sort of something way up here that says, okay, I know what your rate of decline of dopamine production is going to be. I want to do something up here. And then I want to have some sort of a, a pill or a vaccine or a shot or a something that's going to change your rate of decline. All right, I'm going to change your rate of decline. So you end up way over here. And you don't get below that 15% threshold until, say, age 105. And, well, you didn't make, you didn't make it to 105, right? Like maybe you, you died at 95 uh, uh, from something else, and then you never showed signs of Parkinson's disease. So I, I think that's how people are going to be dealing with Parkinson's at some point in time in the future. And there's a lot of really cool research on this idea. Uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, all of the different things we've tried to slow down Parkinson's disease uh, none of them have been able to slow down Parkinson's disease. Uh, and there's also a lot of work with things like Michael J. Fox Foundation and stuff of being able to predict who's going to get Parkinson's based off my little graph there. So we don't have those things yet, although there's so much cool research happening in Parkinson's uh, with the help of American Parkinson's Foundation and these sorts of things. 
um, that you're really hopeful that you're going to have something that genuinely slows down Parkinson's disease. You know, and then the, the second half of that question is, well, what if like, poof, like magic happens and all of a sudden we have something that stops Parkinson's disease right now, uh, which would be really fantastic. Um, but once that damage is done, that damage is done. So I don't expect anything that would reverse the signs of Parkinson's, but if we could get something where, where Parkinson's no longer progresses, that would be just incredible. That is a fantastic question. And we've had someone write in, when do you think a cure will be here? Always be careful when you're predicting the future. Like, hell, I don't know. You know, <laughs> like if you want to say things like sometime in my career, um, but I don't know how long I'm going to be a neurologist, you know, like, uh, I, I, I love my job. I don't think I'm going to get fed up with it tomorrow or something, but you know, like, I, so it's really difficult to say. Um, although I can tell you, there's a lot of, there's several things that are in phase one and phase two of research trial right now that look really promising. Uh, and, and it really just takes one to be able to make it all the way through those research trials and then get FDA indication. But as of right now, there's not one that has FDA indication. Um, now but, is a good time to kind of make the call to action for research. So to find a cure, people oh, have to participate in research. And um, just, you know, highlighting the importance of, of finding these advances in medicine and technology comes down to the people who participate in those clinical trials. And we talk about the COVID vaccine, you know, the, that vaccine was not made available until people came forward and said, I'm willing to be a part of this of research. And it's the same for any mm -hmm. disease. Um, any comorbidity, you know, we have to research it to be able to find that cure. Um, the Parkinson's oh, very true. is doing genetic testing for people with Parkinson's disease where yeah. we offer genetic drugs yeah. as well. Um, so these are, these are all, you know, research options people can get involved in. So we're just getting steps closer to finding that cure. Well, it's got to happen. You know, like I tell patients today is the best day in the history of the world to have Parkinson's disease because there's more options available for treatment of Parkinson's disease, but those options are available because patients in the past were willing to go do research in Parkinson's disease. So that's immensely motivating, right? And, and we have all these new cool options to go treat Parkinson's and there's new cool stuff coming out literally later this year. Uh, and, you, and you get things like, um, and then several probably, I don't, I don't know, some, some maybe two, three years out, you're gonna get things like subcutaneous levodopa infusion, which just means like, if you know anybody that has diabetes, and they have an insulin pump. So it's just like a little, a little pump that goes on your belt and then a little tiny needle and it goes just underneath the skin and it gives you a continuous supply of, of insulin. This is going to function just like that, but with levodopa. Like how cool is that, right? I mean, that's going to be a major advancement, um, but it's because people are willing to go do research. So go, go do research in Parkinson's disease, right? It, if you live in the Mobile region, um, I do research in Parkinson's disease, but there's options wherever you are. Uh, I know in Tampa, USF is doing research in Parkinson's. And if you want to go do that, you go to um, clinicaltrials.gov, uh, clinicaltrials.gov. And, and, and then you can just search for Parkinson's disease. And so they'll have any sort of research study that's happening in the United States. And you can go search by where they're at. Are they recruiting patients? There'll be contact phone numbers and stuff like that for you to go call. So um, get up and go make a difference. I think it's fantastic. Thanks, Dr. Dees. So there's two questions that came in live. I want to make sure that we answer the live feed questions. Um, earlier in the presentation, someone wrote in, are Parkinson's patients seem to become more fixated on things? So, I'm sorry, I don't think I heard that question. Could you say that again, Krista? Do Parkinson's patients seem to become more fixated? Um, so developing fixations maybe on uh, challenges, um, conflicts, um, projects, politics, uh, family matters, uh, fixation on, on colors or um, ways to do things. It's possible uh, that you can get into that type of stuff. It's a little bit um, more likely if you're taking things like the dopamine agonists and medicines like Mirapex or Requip or Pramifexol, Ropenrol, Nupro, these types of things. Uh, you know, if it becomes a problem, you need to bring it up to the neurologist uh, or the movement disorder neurologist uh, and there's a lot of different things we can go about doing as far as your Parkinson's regimen. That's a fantastic question. Other other questions for me? Yes, so we have one last question wrote in from BJ. My husband has a new diagnosis of PD. He's 70 and very independent. 
So far, he refuses any meds or physician interventions. How can I help him with any lifestyle changes? Yeah. All right. Never underestimate the stubbornness of the adult male. Like, I think that's really good advice in life. And I get to say it because I'm an adult male, right? And it's going to be worse for those like type A guys, you know, like the doctors and lawyers and engineers and, you know, because we're all a little bit OCD and ADD and like, I get it. It's a problem. You know, it, you, I think there's also a component there, or, or at least I've seen it in the past, of um, not just a personality type, but also there's some fear and acceptance, you know, fear of starting new medicines and acceptance of Parkinson's disease. And, you know, and the thing that I think we fear most in life is the thing that we don't know. So, for you know, the, the monster behind the door in my bedroom is the one that I fear the most. And so you got to break down those barriers and learn more about it. And that, that's all what we're doing today, right? Like learning more about Parkinson's disease, learning more about what the medicines and the options are and these sorts of things. And, and you can do that by, by logging into stuff like this or going to your local Parkinson's support group meeting or just go have a conversation with a movement disorder neurologist uh, if you've got one there locally. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you got to go start taking medicines, start taking pills, but let's start learning about what the options are. Uh, in answering questions. And, you know, I always tell my patients when you're going to see your neurologist, it is perfectly great if you walk in and you just got a list of questions. Like you got 20 questions laid out on a piece of paper, and then we're just going to go bam, 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 right through the list. That's a fantastic way to go do things. Um, so, you know, I really encourage that just to learn more about Parkinson's disease. Um, I think can really break down a lot of barriers. It's a great question. What other questions you got for me, Krista? Uh, we had one final question for Deb. She wants to know, are there any real inform um, new formations of levodopa or they just kind of keep changing the chemistry of it? So, yeah, so levodopa is levodopa and there are a bunch of different versions of it on the market now. So you get things like Briteri, well, maybe that lasts a little bit longer, Cinemet CR, and we talked about that with the, maybe lasts a little bit longer, but uh, variability and absorption. Just regular cinemat, immediate release cinemat. Um, Stilevo, like we said, is carbidopa, levodopa, and decapone, all in one combination pill. Uh, and then you get things like inhaled levodopa uh, for rescue medicines and Parkinson's disease. Of, I'm in the off state right now. Um, but, you know, with levodopa, it gets converted directly into dopamine. And Parkinson's is a problem where the brain doesn't make enough dopamine in the first place. So there's a reason that it's one of our mainstays of treatment in Parkinson's disease. You know, people forget that before before Cinemet came out in nineteen was it in the nineteen sixty seven that Parkinson's was a surgical disease, and so we would do things like um, you could uh, burn or freeze a hole in a specific part of the brain that's helpful in Parkinson's disease. And we kind of got away with that when Cinemet came out because it made such a, a dramatic difference in our patients. And then that idea is actually carried forward into deep brain stimulation now. So just briefly, uh, deep brain stimulation is a type of surgery for Parkinson's disease where nobody's burning or freezing holes or anything like that. But it, it, it functions kind of like if you know anybody that has a pacemaker for their heart. So there's a little battery. Everything's underneath the skin. There's a little battery underneath the skin. Um, I think it is like kind of about the size of like a, um, a uh, driver's license, but it's a little bit thicker. Uh, and everything's underneath the skin. There's a wire that goes underneath the skin up to the top of the head. And then there's this tiny electrode that goes into the right part of the brain that's really helpful with Parkinson's disease, particularly things like dyskinesias and tremor. Uh, though it can be helpful with the small slow movements and muscle stiffness too. So, you know, there, there's a lot of options out there that aren't just cinema. Um, but uh, that's why levodopa is such a critical thing with what we're doing in Parkinson's disease. That's a fantastic question. So just to end um, our time with you, Dr. Deese, if you could wrap a statement up in a pretty bow and give it as a present to a patient that you're diagnosing really with Parkinson's disease, what would you have to say to them? Hope. There's a lot of hope in Parkinson's disease. There's so many different medicines um, for Parkinson's. Go find the movement disorder neurologist, find the right one for you. Um, learn more about the disease. This is really common. You know, the reality is that all of us are going to get something. And, you know, I don't know what mine's going to be yet, but it's coming, you know. And so as we make our way through life, um, you know, these things kind of, they get doled out to us and that's okay. 
um, don't be afraid to talk about it or afraid to talk to your um, your friends or family or spouse. Uh, depression, anxiety is real. Talk about those things. Go look for help with the subspecialist there. Um, there's an incredible amount of research that's going on. Um, and, and by working together and working together in these sort of support groups, uh, incredible, immense things can happen. So I, I really want to deliver that message of, of hope in Parkinson's disease. Well, thank you for, you know, inspiring us to feel hopeful about Parkinson's disease. And I, I just want to thank you for your time today and for walking us through the foundational knowledge for Parkinson's disease. So before we conclude our time together, I want to be sure to share some special events and dates with you all. So take a look at the screen. You can see some upcoming events um, in your area throughout the Gulf Coast. We're hosting a virtual educational event for the New Orleans area on March 25th. And you can mark your calendars for our upcoming moving day experiences on April 17th, which I believe Dr. Deese is a part of, and on May. Oh, I'll be there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Stacy's on the call today. She's listening in. So I'm sure she's very happy that we just did a shout out for you in our moving day, South Alabama. So find events near you on by visiting our local Parkinson's chapter webpage at parkinson.org backslash Gulf Coast. And a final thank you to our sponsors, Acadia, Medtronic, Kiowa, Kieran, Amnil, Synovian, and Accorda. Our programs would not be possible without the support of our sponsors, so thank you. And finally, a big, big thank you to our expert speaker, Dr. Daniel Deese, for your time and for everyone behind the scenes who made this event possible. And many thanks to our audience for joining us today. Just to let you know that today's session has been recorded and it will be archived on the Parkinson's Foundation YouTube channel, will be accessible in a few days. I know Dr. DC, you're eager to share that with your patients, so I'll be sure to share the link with you as soon as it goes live. A link to the recording of today's presentation will be included in your follow-up email. So for those of you who joined today and registered for our event, you will receive a follow-up email to the link of this recording. You can review all the information that Dr. Deese was able to address today. And of course, always reach out to our helpline if you have any more questions uh, um, during your Parkinson's journey. Feel free to stay connected with your local chapter, Parkinson's Foundation staff, myself, Krista Ellis, Stacey Faber, and Jennifer DeGruccio by visiting us on our chapter webpage, parkinson.org backslash Gulf Coast. And you can find local resources, local doctors, local experts such as Dr. Deese um, in your neck of the woods, or you can email gulfcoast.parkinson.org. I want to thank you all and most sincerely, Dr. Deese, for your time today. I really, really sincerely appreciate, you know, having this coffee chat um, with myself and engaging our communities across the Gulf Coast. I appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us today. Oh, absolutely. I'm very thankful for the opportunity and I love working with you guys. So let's, let's go do more stuff. It'll be great. Absolutely. Uh, one more thing to note, I know there's lots of questions about COVID in relation to Parkinson's disease. We ran short on time today. I would like to highlight some of the resources that the foundation offers. Our medical um, director for the foundation did do a Facebook Live addressing directly Parkinson's disease and the vaccine. You can check that out on our YouTube channel, our Facebook page, Parkinson's Foundation. Um, and I just hope that you all stay healthy, be well, and I hope we will see you guys soon. So thank you, Dr. Deese, and thank you everyone who's joining us today and tuning in later. Fantastic, yeah, I appreciate the time, Chris. All right. Bye -bye.